Dr. Deidre Johnson. Hello. Hi, good morning. Oh, good morning. Thank you. Thanks for coming out here. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> did you didn't get too lost or found it all right, did you? Oh, no, I rely heavily on Google Maps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's like a godsend, that thing. Yeah, no. I can't remember how we used to get around. Actually, I know, I do remember because I found one in an old car a while ago of a street map. You know, those like the street maps, and you actually have to fold it out and stop on the side of the road and go, no, 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 A4, no, 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 ah, no, it's A7, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely used to. I feel like I learned um, geography a lot yeah. better using those street maps, right? You sort of get yeah. lost a couple of times and then you know it. Yeah, you, you have to, mm -hmm. I think. That's, I was talking to someone about this the other day, about the, uh, the British cabbies when some of them, some of them died. And they allowed their, well, I believe this was true, allowed their brains to be used for research. Oh, I thought it was New York City cab drivers. Oh, was it? Well, maybe it's New York City. That's and, a story I heard, yeah. And they found that, like, the geographic area of their brain was bigger than normal. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It's, it's been... 20 years remembering street names and locations. So yeah. the brain grew like a big muscle. I know. Like yeah. no Google Maps available. They just knew mm. it. Yeah. Mm. The knowledge. That's mm -hmm. what they used to call it. The knowledge. They, mm -hmm. had, they had the knowledge. <laughs> Is that what happens in the brain? Does it grow like a muscle? Oh, I don't think it grows exactly like a muscle. But yeah, it can definitely be reinforced in certain regions um, when you use it a lot. And is that reinforcing more neurons go there or do those neurons make more connections? Like what do they sort of mean by Yeah, so it's, it's more reinforcing the connections oh, between yeah. the neurons. So, um, yeah, for example, people that are, you know, musically talented, you can, and again, this isn't my area of expertise <laughs> in terms of imaging, you know, musicians, um, but when you image their brains, you can tell that the, you know, the area responsible for music, it, it looks different ah. and it's... I'm not sure exactly if it's bigger, but yeah. it's definitely, you can tell the difference between musician and, and non-musician. Lights up more when music's going or they're thinking about music or something than other yeah, people like do. Yeah, like those connections are a lot stronger. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing, the, like the, I guess it's, I don't know if plasticity is the right word, but the the scope of function that the brain can adapt itself to. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I'm going to be really good at music, so okay, that part grows. Or I'll be really good at maths or something. Yeah. 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 Um, so I was hoping that we could talk a little bit about because I read some of the work that you've done, but like a little bit around sleep mm -hmm. and our brains. Like, what's going on when we're sleeping in our brain? Anyhow. In our brain. Yeah. 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 No. Um, so I guess a forewarning, um, I have extreme interest in sleep. Um, and this has been my area of research, part of my area for research for a couple of years now. So I'm still relatively a newbie in this field and compared to other people. Um but I think generally, um, when you think about sleep, and some people don't realize this, that it's not just it's not just your body losing consciousness, mm -hmm. right? There's actually a lot of things that are going on um, when you go to sleep that are super important in all kinds of different you know daily functions and health, uh, longevity, et cetera. So there's, I guess you have to think about sleep and there's different kinds of sleep. So when you go to bed at night, um, you're not just going to fall asleep and it'll be the same throughout the course of the night. So there's different stages of sleep. You probably would have heard of REM sleep REM before, sleep. rapid yeah. eye movement sleep. Yeah. Um, and it's termed that because you normally get this very rapid eye movement. Um, Weird. And oh, it's, so they've been able to stage the different kinds of sleep using something called EEG. So electric encephalography. Um where they put essentially probes on the, you know, on your scalp um, and they can detect brain activity over sort of the surface of the brain. And in doing so, they can compare the brain activity um, compared to someone who's awake mm -hmm. and then throughout the course of the night in sleep. So there's right now they've classified. So you've got REM sleep. Um, is and that, then is that your dream sleep? Is that when you're dreaming? That's, yeah, normally thought to be dreaming sleep, but you do actually dream um, in, in sort of throughout the different phases of sleep, but it's, um, I guess, stronger and happens more often during REM sleep. So there's REM sleep and then there's non-REM. And then non-REM itself has been um, distinguished into four different stages of sleep. And those will sort of depend, um, they're classified based on the kind of brain activity that's going on. Uh -huh. So REM sleep is really interesting. So REM sleep, uh, if you're looking at EEG, so you're measuring the brain activity, it looks very similar to the EEG activity that happens when you're awake. 
It's right. very, very similar. Um, the main difference that you see during REM sleep is that you lose um, muscle tone. Oh, yeah, yeah. And a lot of that is important so that you're not acting so out your out. dreams and thrashing yeah. around. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? Like, how does, how does the brain do that? Oh, it's going to stop you from being able to move for a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I feel like I, I don't know exactly how it does it, but um, an adaptive kind of response so that you're not going to injure yourself yeah. um, while you're acting out or, your or others. <laughs> or others, right? Yeah. <laughs> So um, so there's REM sleep that looks very similar to waking, except you lose muscle tone. And then there's a non-REM, which in terms of brain activity, um, as you go uh, sort of stage one to stage four, you get, um, it goes from sort of moderately deep sleep to very deep sleep. Mm-hmm. So stage four is the, you know, the deepest sleep. Yeah. Um, and it's usually uh, characterized by... Um, very synchronous sort of slow activity in the brain so you have it's really relaxed activity. like relaxed so, but um i guess and sort of if you think about it um it's like maybe a choir that's going on in your brain right so when you're awake you've got people that are just singing all over mm-hmm. the place um and singing to each other and to other people whereas when you get into deep sleep it becomes a more a lot more synchronous so people uh. are singing together stopping together, ah. singing together, stopping together. Um, and that's, yeah, sort of happens gradually through the stages of one to four. Um, and then you can see this on the, the, the EEG, EEG, right? You can see how the activity is a lot more... Um, is it like a, a wave? Kind it? of like a wave, yeah. yeah. So with, um, with REM sleep and, you know, waking, you get these really high spikes, um, that happen. Whereas with slow wave sleep, it's more, um, it's a lot lower frequency. Yeah. Um, and then it's sort of, it's, it's a lot more like wave like, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I also learned in the course of um, learning all about sleep is that, so usually the average person um, will sleep seven to nine hours a night. Um, and they go through, um, usually you get the cycles of sleep are about 90 minutes. So right. again, this is average. Not everybody's the same. Average of 90 minutes where you cycle through the REM sleep and then down into the the non-REM deep sleep and right. then sort of cycle back again. So that 90 minutes gives you the full REM and then the four stages and then REM and the four stages. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But the thing that happens is that the ratio of REM to non-REM sleep changes throughout the night. Mm. So in the first part of your sleep um, session, you'll experience a lot more deep sleep and less, um, like so non-REM and less REM sleep. And then closer to when you're waking up, you're going to experience that ratio of REM sleep is going to be a lot higher, which is sort of why people will remember their dreams more when they wake up in the morning. And I guess maybe if you've woken up while you're in that REM sleep, you remember them because it was just happening, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you wake up in the non-REM stage, it's like, I know I was dreaming last night, but I can't remember what it was yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, there's, sleep is complicated. Yeah. Um, there's so many things going on, but it's, yeah. It sounds almost like a... Um, like a battery recharging cycle, you know, like it's it's doing something and then cycling through and cycling through and kind of wearing down after your four, four cycles of the night. Well, that's it. You've recharged. Well, not that you've recharged, but it's because mm-hmm. of a bad analogy, but it kind of sounds a bit like the way the batteries do things like that. Yeah. Um, and like at a biological level then, like what what's actually, what's going on? What's, is, is the brain, it's like the rest of your body's relaxed. You know, we talk about getting sleep, you, re, you rest and you relax. Is your brain relaxing though? Or is it still very active and doing things? Yeah. So I, I yeah, like I said, it it's the activity changes yeah. and essentially it's resting, but not really resting. It's doing all the things that it needs to do to, so when you go to sleep, um, a lot of things happen. So it, it's really important for memory consolidation. So when you um, learn something during the day yeah. and then you get, you know, a proper night's rest, you're a lot more, you're better at remembering the things that you learned the day before. Wow. Whereas if you, if you, you know, cut that sleep short or you have really poor sleep. You don't retain what you learned the day before as you well. You don't retain that information. Um, 
And they've also, again, so these are not studies that have been done by me, um, but other, you know, very um, intelligent research groups across the world, that they, they've done experiments where they measure both the ability to remember things um, the next day after either a good sleep or a less, less uh, quality sleep, um, or the ability to actually learn things afterwards. So for example, children that are going to school, mm -hmm. if they haven't had a good sleep the night before, they're a lot less likely to be able to learn, learn during that school day because they haven't been properly rested. So, yeah, well, it makes sense. If you do physical exercise, you go hard one day, the next day you're like, oh, you know, you're sore. It's hard to go hard again because, you, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess you've rebuilt your energy stores, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, the thing that I wanted to ask about the really cool sounding thing, the glymphatic clearance. Mm -hmm. Is that one of those processes that's going on when we sleep? What yeah. is it? What is it? Yeah. So, okay. So we'll, we'll, um, back up a bit. So glymphatic, the okay. word, um, was actually termed for a, a combination of two things. So lymphatic, yeah. lymphatic is the body's, um, sort of drainage so, system. Yeah. Um, and then glia. So glia are a type of cell in the brain that are not neurons, um, they're composed of, usually glia refers to a few different cell types. So astrocytes and microglia, um, they're traditionally thought of as support cells that are just there to support the neurons. But now we know a lot more structural support that, that yeah, yeah. And so to sort of so provide, I guess, you uh -huh. know, uh, nutrients yeah. or whatever the, the neurons need, um, which they do do that. Uh, but they're all also involved in a lot of other processes, sort of uh, maintaining, um, I guess, protecting the brain. Um, but these ones are actually, there's a huge amount of the brain is actually glia. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of glia. Because you think it's all just neurons, but no, it's like 30 or 40% glia or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of them, um, and they, they do a lot of things and are essentially critical to brain function. Um, but so this the word glymphatic is putting the word glia and lymphatic together, um, and I'll tell you why. So they've, they've made this association with these two things because um, historically the brain was not the, you know, sort of the lymphatic system. So the drainage, it drains waste from your body. Um, they didn't think that it went essentially past the neck, uh, that it stopped there. Yeah. Um, and the brain you know, did, they did something else. Did something they didn't really magic know about. with the rubbish. Yeah. Um, and so it was about, it was in 2012. Um, in the lab of someone named Micah Niedergaard in um, Rochester. And my um, previous mentor, Jeff Iliff, who's now at the University of Washington, who I've recently trained under. So they did some experiments and they actually found that the, the brain has its own like, lymphatic-like system. system. And it's the way that the brain is able to actually sort of clear waste. I don't really like that word waste, but just for simplicity terms. Yeah. Um, so essentially, uh, your brain has cerebral spinal fluid that's made um, by the choroid plexus. Uh, it sits, sits inside the ventricles. So the ventricles are sort of like blank spaces inside the brain. Um, the choroid plexus makes the cerebral spinal fluid, and then it kind of flows through um, around the outside of the brain. And what we previously understood is that the cerebral spinal fluid is just like a cushion mm. kind of protects the brain from bouncing around yeah. um but actually what's really cool and what they discovered in 2012 is that the cerebral spinal fluid not only does it sort of flow around the outside of the brain but that it then penetrates uh -huh. into the brain um around the blood vessels so your brain has a lot of blood vessels yeah. because it needs a lot of energy yeah. like high activity needs a lot of nutrients and energy um, and the way that it gets this is through you know a lot of blood uh -huh. vessels delivering all these nutrients so the cerebral spinal fluid flows up and around the brain penetrates down into these blood vessels i'm uh, sorry beside the blood vessels um, and then can exchange um, with the brain tissue so i guess i'm trying to think of a way think about sort of a plumbing system, yeah. right? So you're sort of distributing yeah. the water yeah. to, you know, different houses that it has to go in and then the houses need to get rid of their waste. Yeah. And so the way that it does this is then the cerebral spinal fluid goes 
flow so it actually sort of flows outside, then outside so. um outside their brain via sort of beside veins so yeah. arteries go in veins go out and it goes out along veins um and then gets actually um taken up by the more recently discovered lymphatic system that actually exists on the outside of the brain, brain. sort of just under the skull wow. so like all of these things that were just recently discovered yeah that's amazing that now we're like oh that yeah. makes sense yeah. like that's how the <laughs> fluid moves around the brain it doesn't stick there it's yeah. like stagnant we've um, been really stupid before thinking this did it itself <laughs> magically <laughs> right. yeah. yeah um so yeah so the this discovery happened in 2012 um so they're like oh okay so this is how it sort of moves around um, and then they, shortly after that, they realized that this specific process of the fluid moving around and then sort of being cleared, so the waste getting removed, um, is highly dependent on sleep. So uh -huh. when, uh, when you're sleeping, this process, you know, is very active. Yeah. So there's lots of fluid flow and lots of sort of waste clearance. Whereas when you're awake, this is very slow. It still happens. But it's very, very slow. So I wonder, though, through those non-REM four phases of sleep, when we're saying it's almost like a wave, maybe it's almost like a pump. Yes. And oh, my it, gosh, yes. And it's just pumping the yeah. fluid slowly through and doing that cleansing cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So um, through a, you know, a number of different studies, researchers have actually, yeah, it's sort of the, um, if you think about blood vessels, so blood vessels were sort of, pump right yeah. to move the blood flow um and the way that they think that this happens to help facilitate uh the movement of the fluid you know beside the vessels around the outside mm. is that this pulsatile flow is not only moving the blood that's inside the vessels but it's also mm. helping to move What's the, the fluid that's on the outside so it is I, like a pump I, I wonder too if it's because your chorus analogy was really good. If there are sections of the brain where I'm guessing all of the, the neurons are kind of firing together, like we're saying in a wave or a pulse, mm -hmm. even at a an electromagnetic level, they're probably like sending an electromagnetic wave mm -hmm. across, and which and so if any particles in the cerebral fluid, which might be waste particles, I guess if they're charged, they might just then be also getting a little assistance and push along. It's a, the brain's so cool. It is, yeah, it is very cool. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. yeah, and I think the, the discovery that this process is, you know, um, so it's, it's most active during slow wave sleep. So like you so, said, when yeah. you've got that, like, most synchronous sort of neuronal activity, um, and then now a lot of research is being done looking into the links between sleep or, um, you know, sleep disruption or poor sleep health and how this process of clearance might be affected. I, and then what sort of that leans to, what like what happens if your brain if, can't clear itself? If you're a person who, for whatever reason, never gets good sleep, you're, you want to be on eight hours, but you get three hours or four hours of broken mm -hmm. sleep a night. Yeah. Not good for your no, it's cognition. Not no. 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 Does it is there any indications of what it does lead to? Um so to date, obviously there's no um causal mm. uh experiments that have been done in humans yet, because that takes a very long time. Um, but they've done some some experiments in using animal models, but also a lot of um, association and sort of correlative uh, studies in humans, sort of linking, um, you know, sleep disruption, lack of sleep to downstream cognitive impairment and even things like Alzheimer's Absolutely. disease. Um, and because Alzheimer's, is that the one where you get the the plaques and the there's a name for it like stringy or f sticky or something tangles yeah tangles. so yeah. yeah tangles so so alzheimer's disease is um characterized by um the accumulation of proteins two of those being amyloid beta which accumulates um outside of cells and kind of forms these plaques that you can see in the tissue when you stain for it um and then the other thing is these um it's neurofibrillary tangles uh, composed of tau. So both of these proteins are, are natural. They're, you know, in your brain, they're supposed to be there. They do important things. Um, but in certain cases, when they, 
you know, cannot be cleared or if there's potential, you know, the cells are, you know, damaged or harmed or unhealthy, then these proteins start to accumulate. So I, totally. It's like feces is totally natural, but you let it accumulate around you. Right. It and gets you, gross. <laughs> it gets gross and you get sick. Yeah. But as long as you deal with the waste management, you're okay. So, yeah, yeah it makes total sense. If you're getting – and so is there – is there direct uh, is there a correlation between the fact that, or, or can you see the 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 process to remove those tangles that does happen with the deep sleep? Like, is that part of what you can see being cleared out? Or okay, so that yeah, so that's I think direct evidence. Not so. There's a lot of um, linking evidence to suggest that yeah. that's indeed the thing. So um, they've done studies, um, I think, both in humans and animal models, where they measure. So in humans, you can't in live humans, you can't directly, well, not directly, measure the amyloid plaques in the brain. There's yeah. different ways to do it. So you can use PET imaging, um, which allows you to sort of see um, certain proteins, depending on what um, pet you're doing. So you can see amyloid or tau in the brain, but you have to have a, enough of it to be able to see it. See it yeah. okay. um, you can also detect the protein in the cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. But you need to put a needle into you your neck and take some out. You have to have a lumbar yeah. puncture, yeah. which are not pleasant. Mm. Um, but they can do that in what they... So essentially, they can measure the, the protein levels um, of these two things in the CSF, either in you know people that are healthy versus people that are not, or they can even yeah. do it over the course of the day. And what they see actually um, is that during sort of the night, when people are normally sleeping, is when you see higher Their levels increase. of this stuff in the CSF because it's being taken out. coming out, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, as opposed to during the day, so there's sort of less in the CSF, there's less clearance that's happening. That's that must be so um, so heartening for yourself, like that discovery in two thousand and twelve. That wow, there's still cool stuff to be found out there. You know, yes. like if we yeah. keep researching and looking, there's a real chance we could win the lotto here and just <laughs> discover something that no one's figured out before. Yeah, yeah, That's... that was. Um, I remember I watched. Uh, it was an online symposium um, with uh, Jeff Iliff, and he was giving a talk, and they were. It was all about. Um, you know, cere cerebral spinal fluid or CSF dynamics, um, and he was presenting. And I remember, I feel like I was quite f just sort of fangirl. I, I watched this, yeah. like the symposium over and over again because I was so fascinated. Yeah. And I was sort of pretty late to the party. I think it was 2000. 16 maybe i first and i was like oh my gosh I, i'm four years late like i didn't even know that this was happening and then i became sort of obsessed i was like i have to know i have to you know understand more about this and why it's happening yeah. and you know what is it changing and how does it affect our brains and yeah. so i got yeah pretty oh well that's a that's a whole new field of um treatment options for things like dement like dement uh, alzheimer's sorry what you were mm -hmm. saying there yeah because it's just a, such a um logical mechanical process if you're not cleaning your brain out shit's going to build up and it's not going to work well you're going to get right? sick yeah so it's i think it's just it's amazing at if you really think about it the implications that it has because it's not just clearance right so it's it's a movement this this fluid yeah. that surrounds all of your you know your brain your brain cells um it's important not just in clearing things but also just transport so yeah. you know your brain needs Nutrients. all kinds of different things yeah. and this transport can occur through the movement of this fluid and then so in terms of delivering things that the brain needs getting rid of the things that the brain doesn't need. Yeah. But then one of the new things that's really coming out, and which I think is really exciting, and once you know clinicians and people that are giving treatments sort of get on board and get you know their heads around it, yeah. um, it also affects drug delivery. So uh, like the yeah. brain, the brain is quite difficult to get drugs into, mm -hmm. um, mostly because of something that's called the blood brain barrier. Mm -hmm. So it's a you know cellular barrier that exists you know at the level of the blood vessels that is it selectively inhibits you know things going in and out. So it does let some things in, but it's very selective. Um, so trying to get 
drugs, you know, into the bloodstream and then into the brain is quite hard. Yeah. Um, so some people, um, d depending on the treatment, some actually deliver drugs directly into the CSF or the cerebral spinal fluid. Yeah. Um, but what we're now understanding about this is that the, you know, the, the effects or the implications of sleep or even the time yeah. of day, you know, if you give someone a drug right before they go to sleep, maybe it's more likely to that get it gets flushed into through. the brain yeah. as opposed to giving it in the morning and have them run around all day sort of and, thing. And it doesn't get in and the potency of the drug wears off after four hours and they've effectively got nothing delivered to where it needs to go. Exactly. It'll just get, you know, sort of processed by the liver and experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's making me wonder, do you know, have they done any work on people, say, who are in a coma or in an induced coma? Do their brains do the deep sleep? cycling and the reason i'm thinking about it is like let's say someone turns up yeah they're 65 and they've got dementia oh, sorry, i keep saying dementia instead of alzheimer's so they've got alzheimer's and you can go oh, it's because of this accumulation of junk we'll put you in a coma for a month and just pump your brain clear and see if that might actually make up for some of the time you lost in sleep you know there's oh. this whole range of things you could start to think about now maybe a treatment that's a weird treatment going to hospital <laughs> be in a coma for a month but if it means at the end of the month you come out and you go wow you know i can think again that's I'll be worth it. Yeah, I've actually never, I've never even considered that. Um, I, I don't honestly know what kind of sleep a yeah. coma is. I don't is. know if it's sleep either. I've, um, I've got a friend who's um, an anesthesiologist I've asked to come on and talk. So I kind of want to talk to him about what he thinks those different states are mm -hmm. as being conscious to being anesthetized, you know, what does happen in the, yeah. in the brain. Um, I just had you, I just thought of something else and I now skipped my brain. Oh, that's right. I was going to tell you a story. Um, I slept for 19 hours once when I was about 35. Yeah. I went to bed at midnight and I woke up at probably 8 in the morning. But I was actually, I'd gone down to the Hawke's Bay and I was sleeping in like a little sleep out house at the back of the house. Like it's beautiful, Hawke's Bay, quiet. Um, it was like a day like this. is probably this time of the year. I can't remember exactly, but it was summer. It was warm, and I slept. I guess I woke up about eight or nine. I just went back to sleep, and I woke up about lunchtime. I went back to sleep, and I probably woke up about three o'clock, and I went back to sleep. At seven o'clock, I woke up. I was like, right, I've had 19 hours sleep, and I, I went out, and after about 15 minutes or so to kind of wake up, I felt like a child. I had so much energy. I felt the most relaxed I've ever felt in my adult life. Like, I've got two kids now, and so I never get the opportunity. But honestly, I'm kind of thinking one day I'm going to book a weekend at a hotel somewhere. I'm just going to lock myself in. I'm going to try and do that again because I was so refreshed. And I guess it's just because I just loaded up like four days of sleep cycles and brain operation into one go. It was amazing. I, I suggest you do it if you ever get a chance. <laughs> Do it. Sleep for try and sleep for two days. I would say you'd come out feeling pretty good. Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> crazy! I I physically I could never do that. I just I automatically wake up. Yeah, it's ridiculous time, like six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I don't know. So from what I know about sleep is that I guess in terms of if you're at a sleep deficit, so you've you know had a really rough week where you've slept only mm. little bits at a time. Um, you can definitely, your body will, will try to make that up by sleeping more. Yeah. Um, but essentially, this is sort of a sad um, conclusion, but essentially you, you, can't, you can't really make it up. So no. in terms of what, what has happened to your body over the course of that week without getting enough sleep, it's not like you reset, no. you know, to before that happened and now you're all good. Yeah. Um, it actually, yeah, um, from, what, from what I've read so far anyways, is that you can't really... It's and do that. It's a, it sleeps sleeps important. And it's one of those things that again I've been talking to some people and it keeps coming up. Exercise, good diet, sleep. Mm -hmm. well, and and being social. Yeah. You do those four things and your chances of like neurogenitive diseases and all sorts of diseases just seem to like drop down. Oh yeah, of you course. And, and if you can kind of even combine them, like being social while you exercise you're just getting all this benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and they're sort of um, like counter dependent as well, right? So um, <clears throat> sorry, exercise affects sleep. Yeah. You know, sleep affects exercise. Yeah. Sleep affects diet and sort of how your body processes sugars and how you sort of res respond to the foods that you eat, what kind of foods you eat. So they're all linked together. Yeah. Um, 
which is yeah. Yeah, it's sort of if you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, makes sense. Oh, of course. Yeah, but it's a weird thing that like it, it's a weird thing that it actually pops up and you go, yeah, yeah, that really does make sense. Like it should just be so commonplace and everyone know it. But and I guess you do. You sort of say, yeah, try to get bed. And when you got kids, you're like you got to have good sleep. But as you become an adult, it's real easy to get into sleep deficit. I mean, mm-hmm. well, kids are a good reason. Kids will yeah. wake you up in the middle of the night. They have nightmares or they get up early and, and you just learn to live with it. But it would be good to find a way. Um, <laughs> A mate of mine years ago, we were at university and we were supposed to be studying, I suppose we were studying. Um, and we would get to exam time and we'd just be cramming, cramming, cramming. Um, we just wanted a can of sleep. Like we just wanted eight hours in a can. We were thinking, if we could market this, we'd be millionaires. <laughs> I'm just giving eight hours. Thanks. I'm good now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> keep yes, going. That would be great. Yeah. But from what I've learned from you today... I, yeah, I kind of thought that, hey, maybe that was actually an option. Like maybe you could just get a drug cocktail, put it into the brain and be like, yeah, your brain feels great. But now I'm beginning to think, no, there's a whole heap of mechanical activity going on that needs to happen for hours at a time to actually let your brain function properly. It's not just sleep in a can. You've just got to get sleep. Mm-hmm. It's got to have some sleep. Yeah, and I think... Uh, who knows, you know, what um, science will be able to do in the future, but definitely at the moment, natural sleep is really the only way to get natural sleep. So there are, I, I, I like that you brought up anesthesia um, because there are, so the, the reason that um, the earlier discoveries about the glymphatic system and it being most active during sleep was because they were, um, they first used, they did some experiments, um, they're using mouse models. Um, and what they did was they used, they were looking at, um, this glymphatic activity during anesthesia and it's a not all anesthesias are the same right Mm -hmm. so some work very differently depending on you know what they're targeting and sort of the level of consciousness that you're looking to get but the one that they were using was um it it very closely mimicked slow wave sleep um, because of this specific target that it had um so then they then then they did some more experiments where they looked at um the glymphatic activity during natural sleep. And it was very similar. But then later studies where they use different kinds of anesthesia. So for example, there's like inhaled anesthesia. There's one called isoflurane, which is used a lot in um, animal research. Um, That actually, and those are some experiments that we've done ourselves, that that inhibits glymphatic activity. Uh, So if you're trying to measure it, um, you, you basically don't see it doesn't happen. So in terms of, again, clinical applications, um, different kinds of anesthesias will affect that yeah. lymphatic activity in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Does, um, have you ever done any investigation into like, you know, power naps, that little afternoon nap, which sometimes you feel so refreshed after you have it? Mm-hmm. Does that, because that does, that's not a full 90 minute cycle. So I wonder... What's going on? Yeah. There? So again, I haven't, but um, from what I've read, um, power naps. At, again, depending on the person. So if you're someone who normally gets, you know, a good sleep, you fall asleep easily and you stay asleep during the night, then power naps shouldn't be a bad thing. So that's sort of a. It's like a a natural kind of lag in your alertness that usually occurs in the mid afternoon, mm-hmm. which according to some experiments, it's not dependent on the food you eat. So if you skip lunch or if you eat lunch, you still have this sort of dip yep, yep. in your alert level. Um, and yeah, having a short nap, again, as long as it's a short nap, right? So somewhere within that 90 minutes, even... 25 it, minutes was the gold one, yeah. I think, as I remember. You get about 25 minutes, you're good. After that, you just feel like, shit. Yeah, yeah. So like a short nap, um, and then you wake up, and as long as you don't have it too late in the day. Um, so, okay, I'll have to go back a little bit. So the reason why we sleep um, and that we sleep at certain times of the day is because there's sort of two processes that are happening. So one is sleep pressure um, that builds up over the course of the day because of a chemical called adenosine that's released in the brain. Sort of as that rises, you feel increased sleep pressure, wow. right? Um, and then the other process that's happening is your your natural um, biological rhythm or your circadian rhythm. Mm-hmm. So usually, when these two things are in line with each other, is when you're going to get you know the best sleep because you're tired at the right time, and you know you're actually tired because you've built up this sleep, sleep pressure. pressure. Um, but then you know you go to sleep, you've relieved the pressure, 
and then you know you wake up and you start the cycle all over again. Yeah. So with naps, um, you sort of temporarily relieve, relieve that pressure. pressure. So if you have a nap, you know, late in the evening, you're relieving that pressure. And then when you're it's set, hard to go to sleep, right? Yeah, because like the pressure isn't there anymore. So, uh, so the so does that sleep process um, that uh, the glymphatic clearance does that work on adenosine? Was it you said as well? Is that because you no, said the adenosine so, that, so that adenosine, causes the sleep pressure? Adenosine. So sleep and glymphatic function are sort of things Did, that are different but happen yeah. at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Gotcha. It's sort of whole different, as, as far as we understand it yeah. now, are sort of different processes, but that are aligned together. Mm -hmm. So the reason because of the glymphatic you know, function works because of the synchronous activity, whereas sleep is mostly because of a whole, there's a plethora of different chemicals that are sort of turned on and turned off to, to initiate sleep and to stop it. But adenosine is one of the main ones. And adenosine is actually we're drinking coffee. So yeah. what coffee does is it, it blocks adenosine receptors. Ah, um, so it stops your sleep pressure increasing for a while. Yeah, so it? it like increases alertness because adenosine can't sort of bind to the receptors to make you feel sleepy. Ah, ah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I drink a lot of coffee. I used to drink a lot of coffee and then I started learning about <laughs> sleep. And so now I usually one or two a day and yeah, you one know, or two pots a day is probably Oh enough. gosh, pots. <laughs> So the, I guess something to think about is the half-life of coffee yeah. or caffeine in your body. So half-life means the amount of time it takes for that full amount of caffeine to be reduced by half um, is about three or four hours. So usually, and it, some people are less sensitive to caffeine than others. Um, and this might be due to, you know, adenosine and how it works in your body, different receptors. Um, but usually three to four hours. So as long as you don't have coffee too late in the day, then it should be... You know, clear it out of your system Give it by the time you go to bed. Stop, but don't have it after, say, 4 o'clock. And if you go to bed at 10 o'clock, you've probably yeah. got a lot of it out of the you, system. Yeah, but yeah. some people, I, I, do, I honestly don't understand how people do this when they have coffee after dinner. <gasps> yeah, my dad does, always does, and he goes and sleeps. But yeah. He has for a long time. Oh, I'm, I'm not a nighttime coffee drinker. No. <laughs> maybe maybe an affogato or something like that, like out at dinner and have a bit of over ice cream, but otherwise not really a coffee drinker. Oh, I so, feel like I'm so protective of yeah. my sleep time now. Yeah. that I know so well, much about it. That yeah, like, you would be. No coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, exercise and sleep. Does Do people who exercise get better sleep? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and so, again, not experiments I've done myself, um, but studies that have been run in humans looking at um, the effects of exercise on sleep is that Yes, essentially all forms of exercise will will um, improve your sleep. Yeah. Um, it depends the level um, and sort of the um, intensity that's required to make those differences. Um, it, those are all sort of person specific and also age specific. Okay. So if you're an older adult, like 65, um, just a low, moderate level of exercise, you know, going for a walk um, or swim or something that's relatively low impact, but at least kind of gets your blood pumping a bit, yeah. um, is sufficient to improve your sleep. Whereas if you're, you know, a young person full of vitality in your 20s, you're very physically active, you'd need a little bit more of that for it for you to see an improvement or a difference. Yeah. Um, but yes, exercise is very good for sleep. And it's, um, I mean, I know the answer to this one, but alcohol and sleep, it's not a good thing. No, no, no it's not a good thing. Yeah. So, um Alcohol will essentially, it's, it's like I said to you before, um, a loss of consciousness yeah. and sleep are not the same thing. Yeah. And alcohol is a sedative mm. and it will help you to lose consciousness, um, but it will not help you to sleep. sleep. And, and actually, may even suppress what's meant to be happening while you're sleeping yeah. because you've been sedated. So you don't yeah. get your clearance. Yeah, you don't get you don't get the you sort of don't cycle through the sleep stages appropriately because there's you actually wake up quite a lot yeah. um, under the influence of alcohol um, and sort of that disrupts mm. sleep in in general. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't take long with sleep too. I've read lots of stories, people in war in particular, where a couple of days with no sleep and you start hallucinating, hearing or uh, auditory hallucinations and things pretty, uh, kick in pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. Um, 
I get, and I'm guessing that's just a build up of toxins and lack of nutrients getting to the brain now because the brain's just like you're saying, it's always in that active awake state. And it's not getting into those clearance processes and other things. Yeah, yeah, and I guess if you think about it, sleep. You know, we spend a third of our yeah. lives doing it, and yeah. like all mammals, even yeah. sort of lower order um, organisms as well. While they, it's hard to specifically classify what they do as sleep, they do go through like rest periods. Yeah. Um, so I think really hammering in the fact that sleep is evolutionarily conserved for a reason. Yeah, and um, it, yeah, it's obviously yeah, it's related to the sun, you know, when, whenever we were 300 billion, sorry, 3 billion years ago, whatever we were in terms of being animal or plant life, yeah, it was reacting to the fact that, well, for a few hours a day, there's just no sunlight. We get no energy intake, so we'll just go <laughs> dormant. And that sort of cycle has become, I guess, sleep for us. We take that opportunity. It's nighttime, quiet and down. But we, I mean, if we discover an alien planet in the future and we look at it, I wonder if we'll look at it and go, what the hell's going on? Look, they're all lying down, going vertical for some reason, like going horizontal for some reason. It's like bizarre animal. Well, hang on, we do that too, everyone around the planet, I guess. Yeah, Goes I would and be... lies down for a few hours and then gets back up again. I'd be very interested to understand the biology of something that didn't need to sleep. Well, I, I would, like I, I you see it here with um, people who live in the far north where they get periods of time where they get no sun, they get all sun, they get no night. And, you know, how that some people can deal with it and other people can't deal with it because that's just kind of evolutionarily different to what we've evolved to have. I think we've meant to have the, the light comes off, off, goes down, it gets a bit cooler, it gets easy to sleep. If that doesn't happen, your body's like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think that's um, your – so your circadian rhythm is influenced by your exposure to light, um, but it's also – so they they did some experiments. I can't remember the names. These crazy scientists. They did experiments on themselves and essentially went into a cave with that was all dark, mm. you know, for a week or something. Yeah. Um, and they sort of tracked their their natural, you know, sleeping waking time, and essentially figured out that their natural circadian clock is about you know, 25 hours or so. Uh, so just in the absence of any light at all, yeah. they would naturally kind of go to sleep and wake up about the same okay. times mm. in, in this 25 hour cycle. That I, 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 whether it was the same study or not, but it was a similar um, approach. Some people put themselves like, yeah, into a, a cave with no, no sound, no light, no nothing for a few days. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it was a few days, maybe it was a week. But one of the things that they all encountered like when they came out and they came out into the light they were just blown away by the beauty of everything they were like the trees are amazing look at the <laughs> sun the grass they were just were astounded and you, you were seeing them the film they weren't faking it they were like just blown away by the beauty of everything after being sensorily deprived mm -hmm. for so long they couldn't handle it <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. i couldn't it's, imagine that experience that would be no kind of I, I kind of thought it'd be a fun thing to try just to see what did that really feel like do you really walk out and go oh my god everything's just so amazing when, yeah. when you've had nothing for a while i guess that's why when they do you read stories about Convicts and prisoners just don't put me in the hole. You know, they just don't want the solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. That sensory deprivation is not good for people. No, That's no, hard. I don't think so. Not not long term. I no. I wouldn't imagine. Yeah. Um, and and long term, it's doing something to the brain because they do. They start to hallucinate. They talk to themselves because there's no sound. There's no one talking to them. They talk to themselves. And mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I know that. Um, I'm again. I'm not a psychologist, but I could I could imagine that would be quite terrible experience yeah. um but i know even in some places where they uh have a lot less sunlight so for example some the, mm -hmm. the nordic regions or um i know even some areas seattle for example mm -hmm. where there's a lot of cloud cover yeah. so you don't get as much sunlight yeah. um that, that that definitely sort of affects your you know your emotional state yeah well look at the grunge music came out in the 90s all <laughs> sort of dark slightly depressed music like good stuff but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't beach boys let's go surfing music no <laughs> no yeah. yeah yeah sunlight has a huge effect on us you know whether we think it does or not even I'm, I'm, you know my wife's told me that yeah, you know, your vitamin D. Really, you should be getting vitamin D sort of around this area of your body, like around the top of your chest. To oh, be, really? Yeah, to where you've got a lot of receptors to be able to absorb the UV and then turn it into your vitamin D. If you're going out and it's just your arms and that, you're not, you've got not got enough skin 
available to actually oh, get it. So, I didn't know that. Yeah, so that's why supplementing with vitamin D is considered to be so good for so many ailments. If you've got in high levels of vitamin D, we seem to cope with pretty well. And they, I don't know whether it's your immune system or your body's repair system, but it seems to play a role in that. It'd mm-hmm. be beneficial if you do have it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So I know some people um, that have those, um, sort of like, not vitamin D lights, but they're little lights. Ah. You know, when they, they live in a place with lots of cloud or yeah. not very much sunlight, then they, you get these little lights to help supplement your vitamin D. But, like, I wonder ah. if you have to, like, walk around without a shirt on sort of thing well, so that you can yeah, <laughs> like, I don't know. it up properly. Maybe. I haven't seen them. Like a little sunbed, but a, like a lamp for you. Yeah, I know some of my friends in Seattle had it ah. um, just because it is so cloudy there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I wonder if it just doesn't do anything if you're only sort of exposing your face and Mate. your arms to it. Yeah, I don't know. I remember um, a couple of years ago, rightly or wrongly, I don't know, I didn't ever check the science behind it, but they sort of banned sunbeds in Australia. And I think they may have done it in New Zealand. I'm not mm. sure. They did here yeah, too. Yeah. Oh, they're yeah. like the tanning beds. The tanning beds. Oh, yeah. Because they're causing cancer. cancer. Mm. I, yeah. I guess, but I guess that's, that was like just too much. You're getting too much at a time because, um, you know, I know. There's plenty of people that have spent plenty of time in the sun and don't end up with skin cancer. So maybe they're just not getting, they've got the amount of, right amount of, um, what's the what's the pigment? Melanin. Melanin in their skin or something to be able to, to regulate it so they just don't get too burnt and damaged. I don't know. Yeah. But you need it. It's a balance, you know, like you need some sun, be kind of too much or you'll get cooked. Yeah. Um, there was another thing I wanted to ask you about. I did make a note on it because I couldn't remember its name. And I think this is something that's in your in the work that you've done, mm-hmm. parasites, mm. the cells that are in the walls of capillaries. Yeah. What are they about? What do they do? Um, okay. So pericytes um, are a cell. So I think we'll go back to what I was talking about before, the, the blood brain barrier. Um, so there's something called the neurovascular unit. So if you think of the blood vessel, it's not, it's not just a tube. It's, a tube, but it's made up of a bunch of different cell types. And specifically in the brain, um, there's one cell type that's called endothelia, and they are the ones that essentially kind of make up the the most basic part of the tube, like right? Like the, the wall of the Sort of the tube. wall of the tube, yeah. Um, and what they do is uh, they're very critical for the blood brain barrier and, and how they sort of they wrap around i'm trying to de- describe this in audio as well so mm-hmm. they they wrap around and sort of link to each other yep. by things called tight junctions so they're proteins that kind of form links between the cells so that they inhibit any sort of movement of things from the outside of the blood and mm-hmm. then into this blood vessel and then around the outside of the endothelia you have pericytes so they're just, they're another cell type um, and they kind of wrap around. They are critical and required for the formation of the blood brain barrier. So if you don't have these cells, your blood brain barrier doesn't form properly. Um, and essentially in different kinds of animal experiments, um, the, the brain doesn't develop properly either. Yeah. So they're needed there. Um, and they also, uh, so that they can signal you know, send signals of th- that are essentially proteins to these endothelial cells and then sort of receive signals from the endothelial cells and then pass them on into the brain as well. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're part of this thing called the neurovascular unit, which is endothelial cells, pericytes that sit and sort of wrap around on the outside. Um, and then on the outside of sort of that is uh, also you'll see astrocytes. So astrocytes are a brain cell that are a kind of glia um, and they are they're called astrocytes because they kind of look like stars they're okay. beautiful cells if you look at them um, and sort of they also sit sort of around the blood vessel providing support but also communication for sort of blood to brain to you know provide glucose nutrients things like that and to stimulate so when the brain becomes active so you've got neuronal activity um the neurons need energy so they do something they signal to the astrocytes saying i need energy the astrocytes signal to the pericytes signal to the endothelial cells to pump blood faster because they need more energy right so that's sort of amazing yeah it's a really cool system um and these pericytes so i did a lot of work uh here in auckland for my phd we were looking at the these pericytes because we get them um 
Okay, so the the work that I did, it was using um, donated human brain tissue from the Neurological Foundation Human Brain Bank, and then there's a Hugh Green Foundation uh, Biobank. So we get human brain tissue that we can stain so that we can characterize disease, um, but we also get tissue that we can actually take the cells and we keep them alive in a dish, and then we can look at sort of what they do in response to different things. Um, so, for example, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, but also a lot of other uh, brain diseases, there's a lot of inflammation. Um, and we're sort of trying to figure out, like, how that inflammation happens. Is it coming from the blood? You know, is it signaling through pericytes? Oh, wow. How is it getting into the brain and causing these problems? So, so when you say inflammation getting into the brain, mm -hmm. can you tell me a bit more about that? Like, what is that? A, is the, when we say inflammation, are we talking about like white blood cells or something getting into the brain and or cytokines or something getting into the brain and they shouldn't be in there? Yeah, or, so essentially... Or too many of them? Yeah, essentially... Do you want some more coffee? Oh, I think I'm okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, essentially, inflammation is usually, usually thought of to be like sort of heat um, and immune response. So your immune cells responding to either an infection or an injury or stress or something like that. Okay. Um, so inflammation in this case and how we were looking at it was the response to cytokines. So for example, if you have inflammation in your body, in your blood, you've got an infection or something, is that able to then in any way signal into the brain? Does the brain know that your body has an infection? Has an infection? Yeah. Um, and so what we... What we, what we saw essentially is using these um, cell culture, so the brain cells in a dish, that these pericytes and endothelial cells, so they can detect cytokines that could be released by immune cells or things in the blood, and then they can propagate those signals. So it's possible that in cases of you know systemic inflammation or like any kind of inflammation that you have in your body, that that is then sending signals through these, you know, cells in the blood vessels into the brain. Uh. Um, yeah. And so essentially that's kind of, and then once you get inflammation is not always bad, um, you, you need it in certain cases, like response to an infection or injury. Um, but the sort of sustained and chronic inflammation is when you start to see problems because then you can get um, neuronal toxicity. So when your neurons are actually you know, dying or becoming injured because there's chronic inflammation. And, and is, is that like an autoimmune? Is that where the body's immune system is, a, is attacking neurons when it shouldn't be? Or it's just, it's attacking things it should be, but there's too many of them there? Yeah, so it's not, not autoimmune. No. It would be, um, it would be more just, um, I guess what things will do is that in, in the case when there's, higher levels of cytokines, these, you know, pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, they can signal to cells. So things like glia, mm -hmm. so microglia and astrocytes that normally are there to um, sort of survey the environment and make sure everything's going all right. And if there's, you know, bacteria or any kinds of other bad things that should be in there, they can get rid of them. Um, they can get I guess hyperactivated, yeah. and they'll start getting rid of things that they shouldn't, um, and sort of gotcha. pruning potentially neurons. But actually, the cytokines themselves—if you if you have cells in a dish, some neurons, and you put cytokines on them—it's yeah. actually bad for them. It can cause the neurons to die, yeah. wow. depending on you know how much and how long. And so, if, if somewhere in your body is producing too many cytokines, it's getting into the getting into the blood and going up to the brain and that's going on all the time, some of those cytokines might be triggering the, the um, pericytes, pericytes, and they're telling the glia, hey, get rid of stuff, and they're like, okay, we'll do it, but they really shouldn't be. They, yeah. And they're getting overworked, and they're starting to be detrimental to the brain. Yeah. So complex. It's, yeah, it's quite complicated. It's so, it's so complex. It blows my mind how, how mechanical it is. Like as a kid, you know, I thought about brain and cells and it was just all just magic, you know, like, yes, you've got cells, you're made of cells. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. But then when you, 
you start to, well, not me look, but I start to see things now on YouTube where there's you know, 3D animations of what's going on inside the cells. Aren't those cool? And there's these things walking along, carrying out bags of rubbish, and there's other things that are like ladders, and they're building connections with each other, then breaking them down again. It's like, it's so complex. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah, and I think that that's, that's why we're still, you know, you think, We've been around and we're, we've been doing this research for, you know, decades. Why don't we understand how the brain works? It's very complex. And, and it's all, you know, like we can communicate. We think we're, we're clever and we are clever. But we can communicate. We can, we can use words and we can use visuals and touch and all these sorts of things and, and smell. And these guys are using stuff like shape and electrical charge, like the, the shape of a protein, the way it's folded then determines on how it interacts with a cell. And if it somehow got folded slightly differently, no, it just it doesn't work. You know, it's that it's amazing. Mm-hmm. It blows my mind, that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think uh, I think just trying to understand understand how things work, but then the more you learn, the more you learn that you don't understand, right? And you're like, oh well I looked at this protein and when I do this one thing, this one protein changes. But what about all the other proteins? And then like that's one cell. But what about the other cells? Yeah. And then that's one organ. But what about the other organs? And like how are they all acting together? Because they are. Yeah. We're just not always looking at it. Well this was amazing for me to hear this about these parasites that they actually they're they're communicating from what's in the blood through to the brain and getting tapped on the shoulder. Hey we need some more glucose. Okay, hey you guys can you pump a bit faster? How does that it, uh, evolution, man. Like that's 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 just. I can see why people are like, no, there there has to be a creator. Like, <laughs> that level of detail, no, no, that just can't evolve. But well, you give it a couple of billion years, it probably can. Yeah. But still, it's insane. It is. Yeah, it's crazy complicated. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. So you, so you're from Seattle. Did you study in Seattle, or have you done your study here in New Zealand? Yeah. So or? I have sort of a crazy career trajectory. Um, I. I'm from Canada, and I did my undergraduate and my master's degree in Canada. Um, And then I came to New Zealand, and I did my PhD in New Zealand, working on pericytes and blood-brain barrier. Um, And then I went to Seattle to train under Jeff Iliff because I was just so fascinated by this lymphatic system. Um, And, yeah, I learned so much there and then essentially took what I've learned there to come back here um, and sort of continue my research in that field. And so that's, is that what, is it Jeff, is it? Jeff Iliff. Is that what he does? He does, he has a team of people researching on in, in that area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So he's, he's doing a lot of work right now. Um, that's, I think is amazing and really pushing the translational boundaries and figuring out, um, different ways to understand the glymphatic system in humans um, and how to measure it in humans, and then how sort of how we improve our our knowledge and our understanding of this process, and how we can use that to help people in different you yeah. know conditions, people that don't get enough sleep, people that are suffering, you know, or might go on to suffer from dementia or Alzheimer's disease, um, or you know, people that have suffered traumatic brain injuries. Um, that's also another case where this glymphatic system you know, maybe impaired. Right. So he's do he's doing a lot of work sort of in that space. Well, again, if we go back to that sort of p- pumping analogy, whether it's r- really right or, or not, mm-hmm. yeah, if you've had brain trauma, like physical trauma, then the, your brain's going to have compressed areas and things where the, 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 the cerebral fluid won't flow properly. And so these areas will not receive the nutrients they need or won't be cleaned out as they need and you get problems there. Mm-hmm. Again, it's like that mechanical thing. Like how do you now address that, you know, trying to expand that? Um, I saw, a, I read a little bit about Neuralink, the Elon's plan to put a, a chip into your, into your brain oh. a, and allow you to allow you... Oh, I'll get to the what I was trying to get to in a second, but the, you put a chip into your brain to allow you to, for example, wireless, wirelessly control your computer. So I could sit here with my laptop and I could I could think open Word and it would open up a Word doc, you know, hey, Google, go and find me something about this. And it would it would do that. It would communicate. Wow. So it's what he's, what he's working on doing is brain originated commands going through this neural link coming out via Wi-Fi and controlling devices. You know, I can fly my plane just by sitting here or drive my drone, whatever it might be. It's crazy. So there's a couple of things that, yeah, it's crazy. 
so the, the but the thing that I really liked about it, or was really interesting, they not only are they doing that, but they're building an entire suite of technology to do the implant because they they're requiring such fine fibers to be delivered into parts of the brain that they're building their own like robots to put the implant in and do this fine precision laying of cables into the brain because like a a, a human couldn't do it. it it's so fine yeah i know this this is in this is insane and so what this got me thinking was okay i can see where i can see where he's going with this i reckon phase 1 is we pick up pick up on your brain signals and we send it out but phase 2 has got to be we go the other way and so you think hey google tell me about parasites and it just goes and then sends back information to you so like you we tap your um, visual cortex in the right way so you see on the screen a picture of a perisite and maybe you see the words a perisite is blah 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 for would you like to click on this link yeah click on that link that's got to be coming and then I was talking to a friend about this the other day on the show. That's a game changer because if you can get that, so if you can get information like the internet in your head effectively and access to that, then I reckon Elon knows as soon as we get the first one of those working in a person, everybody's going to want one because who doesn't want to be that smart? And particularly the envy if you see your friends getting them and suddenly they're like hyper smart and you're not. It's like, fuck that. I'm getting one of those neural links as well, man. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. But I, oh, I don't know. That freaks me out a little bit. I, like, is that, even, is that even possible to retain that much information? Well, it doesn't. I, this is the thing. I, was, I don't think you need to retain it all. You just need to have access to it. It's just like here going, okay, I want to go and learn about parasites. Okay, I'm going to Google it. It's going to take me a while because I'm a human interface into Google. And I've got to read this and I've got to read that. Mm-hmm. Well, now you could like use ChatGPT and say, tell me about perisites. And it'll just give you the summary. It'll give you a really good summary of it. But now you're going to, going to get that summary. You don't have to go to the computer. You're just going to get it dumped. You'll think about it. Tell me about perisites. And it's going to go, sure. And it's, it'll dump that into your brain one way or another. It's not going to form a memory for you straight away. Mm-hmm. But I imagine we're going to trick the visual cortex into you think you're going to see it and read it or hear it in your chosen voice. Oh, a parasite is blah, 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 blah. And then once that's coming in, I guess your brain's going to go, well, that's information. I'll form a memory on that. And you'll start to form the memories on it. Like, you Because know, the senses are a weird thing, aren't they? You know, like the, the light hits your eyes. It goes into your brain and it gets mapped or transformed into a, an image. Mm-hmm. But any point from here inwards, we could effectively hijack that. You know, if we knew how to do it, had the technology, we just hijack a completely different image in here, like filters on, you know, you could be looking like a bear or a gorilla and I could be looking like a dragon because we've just turned on the little filters in here. It'd be great fun instead of doing it on your phone. <laughs> you know? I used to do it in meetings, boring, boring, boring corporate meetings. You know, 12 people around a room, no one wanted to be there. I'd imagine people in like these intricate big headdresses and suits and things and then you find yourself going, fuck, I better stop smiling. <laughs> I'm weird. <laughs> <laughs> but it made it fun. Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. technology in the brain—a yeah. scary thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I got a, f- a friend was working for a company, um, and they were trying to work on—I think I've got this right—like building a, a helmet to pick up electrical signals from the brain to help people with um, motor motor issue, neuron issues and things like that. So I couldn't speak or unable to control their limbs. But by having this, be able to give them an interface so they could, it might be a wheelchair, you know, so I think go left, go right, go forwards. Um, but we had a real good chat one day about how you could, if you could give them a screen and you could detect their eye movement, because often eye movement is still manageable and detectable from the electrical signals from the muscles. Mm-hmm. Um how you'd start to better develop that interface. So to begin with, it could be, you know, we're trying to have a conversation with them, having a conversation with someone. Um, and you might have, oh, you say, oh, hi. And so you click up there and they'll say, hey. Uh, you know, but then I thought about, well, you know, you get smarter about that because once you know someone, so this is someone you've met before, your conversations tend to roll around in an area or a domain. You could kind of get clever. Like if we met again and I was in the wheelchair, you know, we could, I could always, you could always say, 
hey, you remember the podcast? You know, and we could say that. Or remember we talked about parasites. You could start to like prompt people really, really well. Yeah, it's interesting. There's the, the work you can start to do with the with the brain and. Um, even Dr. Connor was saying one of the one of the people and researchers in her team they're doing work on taking skin cells, turning those skin cells into a type of spinal cell that will replace replace the myelin sheath on your nerves after a crush spinal crush injury. Oh wow! Yeah, and so you know, the end goal being you've got a spinal crush injury, maybe you can't walk or you've got pain, you get an injection of the, your own skin cells turned into stem cells, and they repair the myelin sheath. You get the communication going and the pain stops or the, the movement comes back. This is like the stuff of dreams. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I know that there's a lot of groups that are trying to do um, similar things because neurons um, are, they don't really divide, um, yeah. you know, past a certain stage in your development. So if you lose them, and I think that's a lot of the problems with Alzheimer's disease, is that they they've lost so many of these nerve cells, um, and then you know they try to give them drugs and you know treat them, get rid of the amyloid, and they're like, oh, it's not working. Well, they've already lost, lost so many cells. neurons. You need to somehow find a way to replace those. That's exactly what she's working on because it's a, and again I'll get it wrong, but at Parkinson's I think it was. There's, mm -hmm. It's a it's one type of neural cell that is lost. Yeah, and so. The idea is, yeah, we can turn your skin cells into that type of cell and maybe put them back into the brain so you can get them again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, there's one other thing I was going to ask you. I've forgotten what it was now. I can't think of it now. It'll come back to me. Okay. Anyhow, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the last thing, oh, sorry. The last thing I had on my uh, list of things was um, what excites you at the moment? Like what kind of things are you seeing out there in that field that, you know, in general, not necessarily maybe what you're researching right now, but what are you interested in? What do you think is cool? Um, uh, yeah, I'm probably going to say that what I'm researching is the thing that I think is most exciting. Um, but right now, um, and I think you mentioned this in the email, so you might have saw it somewhere. Um, I'm doing a lot of research right now surrounding something called the choroid plexus. That's right. Um, and it's, I feel like, very undervalued and underappreciated um, because it is it's kind of small. It's sort of super weird uh, and it's very difficult to... Um, Sounds like some people I know. To <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> it's yeah, it's, it's quite difficult to study just because it is quite strange. So it's... Um, yeah, so it's a it's a it's a tissue that sits inside the brain ventricle. So in in your brain, you've got um, four ventricles. Um, two of them are the lateral ventricle, and then you've got a third and a fourth. And they're essentially spaces that holds cerebral spinal fluid. fluid yeah. um, and the cerebral spinal fluid, for the most part, is made by this choroid plexus. And what's really cool, so it sits in the fluid. So if you actually you know can look at it, it kind of just looks like seaweed like oh, yeah. this weird blubby kind of seaweed um and i actually first started getting really interested in it because i was working here in auckland and we were doing some studies with peri sites um, where we were getting tissue from the brain bank and culturing it and we started doing these um what what we called explant culture so it's it's instead of taking the tissue and breaking it up into pieces um so you get single cells uh, you actually keep the tissue intact so that you can sort of look at... It's gross function, right? Right, like as a 3D structure yeah. and the different cell types working together. Um, and we were getting some choroid plexus tissue. And just looking at it under the microscope, I just... I fell in love. It just, it was so beautiful. It's super vascularized. So it has tons of blood vessels. Yeah. Um, and then all around the outside are these sort of like bumps, right? So it, it's... I would almost, if you've ever, you probably haven't, but if you've ever looked or seen like a cartoon or anything of um, what your intestines look like on the inside. Oh, like all the little villi. Uh, yeah, things. like the yeah. cilia and stuff. Yes, yeah. So it's sort of like that. So it's got all these sort of bumps and then there's cilia on all these cells. And it just it just looked so cool. Um, and then, you know, doing a lot of reading about it and I find that, yeah, it makes the cerebral spinal fluid. So it's super important in sort of that process. Um, but it's also it. So I told you about the blood brain barrier. Yeah. So in the choroid plexus, um, those blood vessels are actually leaky. So like, and purposely leaky. What 
forms that barrier is the the outside cells. Those are ones they're called the epithelial cells, and they've got all these cilia, and they actually secrete the cerebral spinal fluid, um, sort of push it out into the ventricles. So they form that barrier there, which means Mm -hmm. that within that tissue, uh, immune cells from the blood can easily kind of go into the choroid plexus tissue, Mm -hmm. you know, sort around, like float around in in the tissue and, you know, assess the environment and detect things um, and then kind of go back into the blood. Or in some cases, in the cases of, you know, some diseases or when there's inflammation or an infection, they can actually through go through into, um, the fluid. into the fluid and then that's sort of Get access to, to the, the brain. brain, right? So it just, it's this tissue that does all these really cool things, yeah. um, but it, it's really hard to study because it's not... You know, it, it's not stagnant, doesn't stay in place uh, because it's in this fluid. It's kind of wavy. Um, and even when you sort of extract it from the brain, it is very... Um, jellyfish-like. Jellyfish-like, right? Yeah. It's super, it's just kind of very Gelatinous strange. Blob. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so I've been I've been working with that tissue quite a lot recently. Um, and some of the most recent work that I've done was looking at the, the big question that I had, right? So, okay, we've got the glymphatic system mm. that facilitates the movement of cerebral spinal fluid that's dependent on sleep. Um, And from recent studies, we see at least in animals is also regulated by circadian rhythms. So these two factors influence the movement and sort of clearance of the fluid. But then the quarry plexus it makes it's the fluid, fluid, right? So what what is the quarry plexus doing and how does it interact with the system to make sure that everything's doing things the way they should, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I look back at the research and there's um, really old sort of 1970s, 1980s studies where they used MRI and they, they can measure the movement of cerebral spinal fluid through certain little um, sort of at the cerebral aqueduct. So it's just a one space where the, the fluid moves from one ventricle to the other. Oh, okay. um, and they can measure that movement. And that's used as a surrogate for, you know, production of cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and what they see is actually that cerebral spinal fluid production is sort of circadianly regulated. Mm. So it's highest at night. Um, and lowest during the day. And I was you, like, want oh. the, you want the pressure for pumping? Right? <laughs> yeah. So at night when yeah. you're sleeping, you get the highest level of production, which helps, I think, yeah. to facilitate this like movement of fluid. Um, so then I did um, some experiments when I was working in Jeff's lab, looking at the impact of, you know, sleep or circadian rhythms on the, you know, the function. And I was looking at gene expression. So what genes are changed in this tissue specifically because genes could be related to, you know, production of the fluid. Mm-hmm. They could be related to immune function yeah. or to the, you know, the secretion of uh, like trophic factors or nutrients from that. So, um, yeah, so a lot of interesting stuff that I've looked at is from that sort of so paradigm. How do you identify the genes that are related to that? What's its name again? The quarry plexus. The quarry plexus. Yeah. Yeah, and the gene expression. Like, how do you how do you get the DNA and go? Oh, this section here is what produces the quarry plexus to be able to f- understand gene expression of it. Yeah. So essentially, our experiment design um, was we had. So this was done uh, in using a mouse model, um, and what we did was we had uh, we wanted to be able to. Um, te- tease apart the effects of circadian rhythms and sleep. So stop me if I'm making things too complicated. But um, we had three um, experimental conditions. So one was um, we extracted tissue um, from the animals when they were in their normal awake phase um, or from their normal sleeping phase. Um, But then we also had a condition where we had these, um, they're called sleep fragmentation chambers. And it's essentially, it's a, very gentle so they're in a cage and there's a bar that kind of slowly sweeps across the bottom of the cage mm-hmm. at regular intervals so stops it sort of sleeping. stops them from sleeping um, but it's very short term it was only for a couple of hours um, but just to be able to dissociate sort of the sleep effect from the other one um, and essentially what we saw and then we so we extract the tissue um, we take out the the rna which is the sort of the genes that are being actively kind of made yeah um, and then we, we look at the differences between the different conditions right. and what I thought was 
I thought that sleep was going to have a big impact, but in our situation, it it didn't. It looked like, um, in terms of gene expression, at least, the it's the circadian rhythms that were dominantly, you know, mm-hmm. regulating gene expression within this chorea plexus. So, sort of going back to the idea that sleep and circadian rhythms, when acting in sync, yeah. you sort of have optimal conditions for, you know, sleep and all kinds of cognitive things, right? And it sort of looks like it's the same thing that when you've got the the chorea plexus potentially um, producing, you know, the highest amount of cerebral spinal fluid, which may be dominated by gene expression and circadian rhythms. Mm-hmm. And then when it acts in concert with the glymphatic system and sleep, then you're sort of having like the best, best case scenario. Best time for sleeping and getting the benefits of that system operating. So the circadian rhythm, can we, can you measure that for yourself? Like can you take blood or something and go, oh, I'm at the high point. Are there, you know, are there chemicals or drugs, not chemicals in your blood or indicators or something? So you can actually figure out when that rhythm is? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think that, um, I think that the, the most reliable way to do that is to measure gene expression. So the circadian rhythm is um, controlled by, in the brain, it's the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, so that essentially is like the master clock regulator in your brain um, and then helps to send signals out to the rest of your body and regulate the circadian um levels of your whole body so essentially every cell has its own circadian rhythm so you take a cell out of your body and you put it into a dish you can measure these circadian specific genes and they'll fluctuate right so after being out of the body for a while you'll sort of lose that rhythmicity but you will see it at the start Um, so you can measure gene expression of Mm. clock genes um, in a person over time. I wonder if you could just use that and go, oh, look, the, given my circadian rhythm, there's no point going to bed now. I'm not going to sleep properly and here I might as well wait till midnight or something. Or shit, I should get to bed soon because I'll probably actually go to sleep easily. Yeah. So actually, this is this is crazy. And this is also something that I've only learned recently in the past couple of years. Um, if anyone's interested in this, there's a really good book um, by someone named Matthew Walker. So he's a sleep researcher out of uh, UC Berkeley. And he's written a book called Why We Sleep. And one of my friends was reading that and he mentioned it to me. And this was around the time that I started being obsessed with the glymphatic system. And so I read the book and it was amazing. Um, But it really goes over so many things about sleep. But one of the things that he also talks about is chronotypes. So um, if you think about it, if you think about the people that you know, and if you know anything about their sleep patterns, um, there's some people that naturally wake up early. I'm one Mm -hmm. of those early people. There's some people that naturally wake up late, go to bed late. So, for example, my husband, he is the opposite chronotype to me. So he is a, like a night owl. Um, and I used to always think, like, goodness, like, why can't you just wake up early? And then, you know, we can be in sync. But actually, that chronotypes are apparently sort of genetically attributed. So this is something that you're born with. It's not something that you can... Easily really change or control adapt. Yeah. or change um, that your circadian rhythm is just naturally set at a, a sort of a certain time. And while you can force yourself to go to bed, you know, earlier or later, you struggle to sleep. You probably. struggle. You don't get as good a sleep yeah. um, as if you, you know, sort of went to bed at a natural time. Yeah. Um, and it's also you see the downstream effects of that. So they've done some studies in humans where they compare, um, you know, sort of disease outcomes of different chronotypes and things like type two diabetes and hypertension, people that are uh, the later, later chronotype, like the night owls are higher risk of this simply because society has been making them wake up early. early. You miss the amount of sleep you want. Right. It's not natural for them. I'm one of those people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it must be so tough. Yeah. We just get used to it. I was actually talking to someone yesterday about this because he's just had his second child. And I didn't realize he said, oh, we just had our son. I thought it was his first one. I was like, oh, man, you'll be okay. You're going to go through this period of time where you'll walk around like a zombie. But you kind of get used to it. And for me, it's been nearly 10 years. and I'm still kind of just in that (laughs) zone with the kids. But I've certainly become accustomed to being slightly sleep deprived. I know it's not good. I'll probably end up with dementia because of it. But I do feel as though at some stage in my life, I've got to get into a routine. I think as the kids get a bit older, it will help of, okay, I'm going to go to bed when I need to go to bed. 
but I'm going to get up when I need to get up, not when they get up and <laughs> get some more sleep. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is something that um, I try to I try to emphasize when so when I'm talking to my parents about, you know, all this cool stuff that I've learned about um, and they, you know, they're asking individual questions about them, right? And they're like, oh, but, you know, I feel okay and I only sleep five hours a night. And I said, yes, but you can't really like you can't do the experiment on yourself, right? So if you deprive yourself of sleep for, you know, five hours a day for two months, unless you then have two months of good sleep and you sort of measure your, you know, brain function or your emotional stress or something. You need your control group to compare against. Like you you need to do that experiment because like you said, you can just adapt. You can also adapt to certain level of starvation it doesn't yeah. mean that you're going to be functioning yeah optimally, optimally. Yeah, right yeah. so i yeah I, I have kids as well so i went through the zombie phase yeah. and thinking back now to now that i i pro- prioritize my sleep quite <laughs> severely um back then when i was not sleeping i was an emotional wreck <laughs> you know just like stress <sighs> levels emotions because you're constantly exhausted yeah yeah, it's just, worn out. yeah, like you can deal. I got by, I survived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, but not optimally. No, no, no. not at all. No. Hey, look, thank you so much for coming in. It's been really nice talking to you. Yeah, yeah, no, this has been great fun. Oh, good. I'm glad you enjoyed yourself. Yeah. That's the kind of, that's a, that's actually really important for me. And so far, everyone who's come on really has enjoyed themselves, which is felt, I felt great about, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, try and make it fun and it must be fun being able to have someone listen to you talk uh, about the things you're interested in. Right. If you think about it, like we're scientists because we're passionate about what we do. So when yeah. someone says, do you want to come talk about it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <It's awesome. laughs> yeah. I've been trying to talk to my friends about it, yeah. but you know, they're engineers and they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Thanks a lot. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, oh man. Such an interesting, such an inter- interesting topic. Like the, uh, the thing I was going to ask about... Um